Hello, I'm Hilton Super, the Vice Chairman of Student Group, and I'm looking forward to interviewing Greg Pepper, the CEO of IOFINET, where we interview people who are changing the world, people that are inspiring us with their achievements and creativity and acumen, with the use of technology. In previous interviews, Dennis Guada and I have interviewed over 200 amazing people and achieved more than 14 million views on YouTube. This interview series on Cities ABC is in partnership with our other platforms, Open Business Council, Fashion ABC, which are all fourth industrial revolution and Web3 enabled platforms utilizing technologies that employ the use of truth and trust through blockchain and the deployment of data analytics, AI and machine learning. So today I'd like to introduce you to Greg Pepper. Welcome, Gregory. Nice to meet you. I'm really, really excited to hear a little bit more about your, you know, your accomplishments in terms of finance and technology, and in terms sure. of wealth management and finance, and also the strategic development sure. of new technologies. You said earlier on that you were born in in Lebanon and were educated there. So tell us a little bit about that. So yeah, well, I was born in Lebanon. Actually, I moved all around the world the first seven years of my year of my life. I've, I've lived in Nigeria, Iran, Iraq, uh, Martinique, and then I came back to France. And I did my uh, study in France up to 18 years old, where I moved to Switzerland, where I did HEC Lausanne. I have a master uh, in Master of Science in Actuaries and Finance. Then I moved into a consulting company in France, which was uh, the main uh, insurance and finance consulting company based in Paris. In parallel, I started to teach uh, actuaries and financial market in uh, a master degree uh, courses in Lebanon at University of St. Joseph. Then I moved to become an investment manager, managing a few funds based out of uh, Switzerland and Cayman. And then I switched from investing, managing funds to become an advisor, a strategic advisor for companies and funds, helping raise money, define strategies. And then I joined a bank in the Bahamas called Deltec that I've uh, act and helped uh, set up a new strategy and a new customer base uh, and behave and, and act as a relationship manager and advisor there. And uh, all that lead to uh, IOFINET, which is now the company for whom I actually founded and I'm the CEO, which kind of summarize a lot of the experience I've had in my life, both in financial world, the actuaries world, the banking world, and uh, and the technology that is in the blockchain and the cryptography technology. And that's, the, in essence, what IOFINET is at the end. It's kind of a summary of all the expertise I developed with my team and try to combine all those elements into a one single goal of improving the financial sector and improving, as a whole, corporate sectors using the best of technology out there. Yeah. That's very interesting because, you know, as you were growing up, um, obviously you did a degree in actuarial science. So you're very mathematical in your approach. And then we're talking to you today and you're very entrepreneurial. So what was the, the your environment like that allowed you to be very involved in technology as you're growing up as a child? At the same time, um, understanding, you know, complex things like mathematics and then see how you can apply that to the real world, and at the same time have an, you know, be driven from an entrepreneur in an entrepreneurial way. Well, uh, first of all, being an entrepreneur is a, a skills. It's kind of to call those soft skills that you do have, or you don't have. I guess my Lebanese side made me entrepreneurial because we are Lebanon is an entrepreneurial country, I think. And it's more about the fact that the background where I've been raised was more about do something that you're passionate about. And if you do something you're passionate about, you will, by definition, excel at it and want to do more and more. And as much as I was passionate about mathematics, I also was passionate about how technology can impact everyday life and how I've always have been keen to try to optimize things and improve things. So, for example, when you go into math mathematical actuarial, it's all about optimizing and measuring risk. But mm -hmm. then when you go into all the other aspects that technology can bring, it's also is the same. Technology comes to optimize processes, optimize data, data and assess assessment with AI, optimize verification with cryptography. All those elements is always running around the same logic, which is optimization and improvement of an existing process to enhance the quality of the service or enhance the uh, quality of the new uh, product you want to launch. And that's something that always tried me because I was always kind of... Uh, Attacked, uh, attached to that kind of things from the early age, always been curious out there about what the technology I had internet very early on. 
I had, um, and that was because I was lucky to be surrounded by a family that actually allowed me to have access to all of that and always were open-minded and ask us to know about the world. And being being traveling on many countries also help you open your mind, I guess. So that's where all that passion came out and uh, the need or will to try to push the boundaries of technology and improve things through through that angle. Well, that's very interesting in terms of pushing the boundaries of technologies. So did you ever do any programming? I did actually a long time ago. I was actually a decent programming, but now to be honest with you, my dev team, my tech team makes fun of me because I call myself a VBA expert, which obviously is absolutely irrelevant nowadays because chat GPT can develop all your VBA macro without any effort. But yeah, no, I did do a lot of programming before, but it was more programming attached to actuaries. So it was more about building up models on uh, mathematical models. So did I do programming uh, the same way my team does? No. Do I understand how it works, the very basics? Yes. Just enough to know that uh, not to ask them too much, <laughs> but uh, but not enough to be able to help them in any way, shape, or form. But yeah, I, I that's something that would have loved to spend more time on, which is programming, because I find amazing the ability for you to code and create something from scratch. That's just amazing. But the closer that I've done from creating something from scratch was when I used to be in high school, not actually in high school, in what we call in French college, which is before high school, which I think is middle school in the US. Uh, I actually did an expose of a subject using an app that allowed you to create a game. And so what I did is I created a presentation surrounding the technology and I developed an app, which was a game that was presenting the uh, the subject that was covering. But that app, I was using a tool that was drag and drop to do the coding for me. But I was always passionate about the idea to create something from scratch. It's pretty awesome. I mean, most kids would love to be able to create a video game. Then you realize how hard it is. And you're like, yeah, that's why other people do it for us. Exactly. Now, the thing is, you know, the, 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 this comment sort of springs to mind. Um, work smart, not hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, what I always say, and I told that to my student at the time in the, when I was teaching in college in the university in Lebanon, it, make sure to surround yourself with people better than you. Uh, so that you can always enhance everything you do. And, and a great manager is someone that is accepting to be surrounded by people better than them in many applications, because then you just combine all that talent and you just orchestrate it, trying to do that at I.O. Interesting enough, you said that you were educated um, you, you, in uh, in Switzerland at Ashose in Lausanne. Um, and that's, you know, a very sort of, would you say, international Francophile uh, experience. And then you went back to teach at St. Joseph's University in Lebanon. And there's a different culture and approach there. How do you, how can you co compare the two? Well, uh, first of all, Ashesse Lausanne has no link with Ashesse Paris, for example. It's just the name Ashesse, but it is actually much more international than the Francophile aspect of it because some of the teaching could be in, in English as well. And most of the teacher are actually, uh, not French or French spoken originally. Mm -hmm. the, the reality is when I got the teaching gigs in St. Joseph University, it was actually the consulting firm I was working for that had a collaboration with Lebanon. And they asked me if I was willing to teach because I have Lebanese uh, roots. And the good thing is they gave me all the freedom on how I wanted to do my teaching. The only challenges I had is that I have to teach a semester in two weeks because I can only, only go there for two weeks because I have my ongoing job, so which I was doing. But the way I did the teaching is, and my time is, I did it the way I always wanted to be done for me. What I loved about Asha Lausanne was about the fact that there were a lot of um, projects. So it was not about uh, writing and learning something that you are taught. It was about how to apply it to the real world. And we had many, many application in Lausanne, Asha Lausanne, that I did in the real world. And I wanted to translate that to my students. So my course was pretty different than the uh, usual course you would see because I was teaching the, the syllabus, what you need to do. But around that, I was giving them an, um, a challenge like managing a portfolio, building up an analysis on a company. Uh, and, and also I was trying to teach them also some key elements about how you should envision your life in the, in the professional world and doing what you love. I mean, one thing that I love to watch and I always recommend everyone to watch is the Steve Jobs commencement speech at Stanford. And that speech resonated to me a lot. And, and that's one of the first things I was always showing to my students when I started the courses. So I don't think there were necessarily a conflict of culture because when you reach and teach at the master level, you can kind of adapt your teaching because master's is 
a degree where you have to learn people to do their own research. And that was the cool part. So I was able to do that interactive courses that hopefully they liked. They never complained. So I would hope they did like. Yes. No, but it's very interesting. You were talking about asset management or fund management. I presume it involved all the different strategies, which in, which were broad enough to be not just long only, but involved other things, yeah. like long, short, event driven, all the sort of the classic uh, strategies. Which are the ones that you like the most? Well, in our case, in my case, I was more driven by the Philip Fisher model or the Warren Buffett model, which is the fundamental um, approach. However, the only difference is that when you look at Warren Buffett, the approach was fundamental on cash flow basis yes. or models that are much more conservative. And Philip Fisher, when you read the uh, his book, his original book, it's a little more open than than that specific area. So in my case, what I was trying to pursue was to try to pursue companies that have some potential in the tech and biotech field and build up a case about how they could be disruptive with their technology into the field where they are in. And that was the kind of things that we raised capital on and tried to invest in with some success and some failures, obviously, but it was more that that logic. So obviously we were not trying to do, um, like I would call algorithmic process, long short. It was more about fundamental approach, fundamental surrounding, you are in a technology place or in an area like biotech where you could be disruptive, what kind of disruptive technology you can build up mm-hmm. and what uh, and what we believe could be a change a game changer and that's what we did and and uh, and I continue to still follow that on the side obviously but that's yeah. really uh, what it came down to and that come from the fruit of what I've learned in school obviously but also by reading reading a lot of books and mm-hmm. from me on a personal standpoint I'm a big Warren Buffett approach uh, but with a little more broader spectrum than just uh, cash flow positive I'm thinking about fundamental in a more larger um, point of view. But this is very interesting. So moving from what we call traditional bid driven uh, markets um, and economies uh, to into, you know, leading edge technologies that are driving the store of value or the representation of value using digital assets. How did you make that transition from the fundamental Warren Buffett Stroke Fisher approach into this this new this new um, paradigm. So, I think there is two two la- two aspect to that because here you're talking about the investment side, so buying a digital asset. Yeah, I do view digital asset in two aspect: the tokenization of it, so all the investment you see, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and you name it, uh, you have it, mm-hmm. and the underlying technology that has been created to make that happen. And I actually do believe there's not enough spotlight on the underlying technology. And I do believe that they're not used the right way yet and not leveraged the right way to actually improve the entire ecosystem, not only digital asset aspect. Now, how did I get involved in it? It was more about the fact of technology aspect of it. The idea that you would be able to create an entire core banking system, which is what a blockchain is, more or less in terms of ledger in a trustless environment and being able to create individualized authentication is a game changer from a technology aspect. It opens up so many doors. Now, from the asset perspective, I mean, at the end, it is truly hard oil. You can make an argument from a fundamental standpoint about Ethereum, Bitcoin, and whatnot. But at the end, it's the same as the same argument you can make about a currency. Why the dollar is worth what it is, there is a trust component to it. The same way as Zimbabwe dollar was great 30 years ago, and now it's not even worse for toilet paper, right? Yeah. So at the end, there's always elements like that that are surrounding by what is backing it. And the backing may not be physical things. It may be trust and trust environment. But for me, it was more about being impressed by the technology as a gig, more than anything that got me involved in it. And especially because I didn't realize they were hard point, hard point for them to get banking or regular everyday things you would expect from any given business, which mm-hmm. obviously attract my attention even further about that disruptive technology out there, the same way the internet was disruptive in 2000. Absolutely. This is very interesting because you just you touched on a very interesting aspect, is that as you start involving leading edge, tech, leading edge technologies, which involve things like cryptography, that involve things to do with um smart contracts and you know all these these words that people go oh it's crypto they label it it's an easy it's an easy way of 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 describing it 
Um, and I, 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 I noticed from what you've done in the past, you started looking at custody, custody of digital assets, which is like the base form of store of value and the trust uh, aspect of your digital assets. Um, what did you learn from that approach in terms of building an ecosystem of custody in a decentralized way so that it's self custody? Can you explain that to our audience, what that really means? Uh, sure. I mean, what self custody means can be very simple. Only you can move a given asset or a given, yeah, well, a given asset held in a given wallet. Right now, if you have money in a bank account and you can see with people on Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, or something again recently, mm -hmm. when those banks were under distress, even if you were sending a wire instruction, they were not able to execute it until they could figure out their balance sheet and, and, and make it happen. Mm -hmm. When you're in a self-custody, if you hold your crypto or your digital asset or tokenized asset in a wallet that only you has the signature on it, by definition, only you can move it. So that's the aspect of self-custody. But where you're right, and I want to touch a point on that, is that's the big thing that I actually find uh, a bit disturbing is blockchain cryptography is just labeled as digital asset. It's all under one big basket, which is Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, Solana, all the token you hear. Yeah. The reality is people don't take a step back about what that technology can bring as a breakthrough. And yeah. they don't look at how amazingly, how amazing and crazy that bunch of developers developed. I mean, the, 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 the technology behind Bitcoin just the concept is mind blowing. Satoshi Nakamoto and whoever was supporting uh, that development process were able to create a complete decentralized system where you're able, to, like, I can trust the fact that you have X amount of Bitcoin in that wallet that you hold. And the worst, the fun part of it is I can't move the money in there. Only you can do that. People only see that as crypto. But if you take that and you translate it to banking, to corporate, to all those elements, you start to find out that you have a complete trustless environment that can reduce fraud, yep. that can give back power to the user, but yet you can still do it in an hybrid model that still make it compliant, meaning yes. that you will still not be funding terrorism or do illegal stuff with it because you can create an hybrid model, but at least you can put back the human being in the equation instead of all making it centralized and push only through those uh, centralized trusted environment or companies. You can still rely on them, but you still have some of that power yourself. And that is a reflection of what 2008 was, because people tend to forget that Bitcoin was created in 2008. And what was 2008? It was the day many people realized, I can't trust my bank. And, and the thing is, the technology, like, of course, is it Bitcoin worth 20,000 or 100,000 or zero? That's irrelevant. I mean, that's good to know for people that want to invest in it, I guess, but it's irrelevant from a pure technological standpoint. Someone was able to create a technology using internet to be able to interact on a peer-to-peer -peer system without having to worry if I need to trust the data shared to me and the transaction underlying that or the authentication. That is a huge breakthrough that can open up so many doors, which is why I was so excited about it. And this is why we started to launch and work on solution around that, which all that start with that basic of self-custody, but it goes beyond self-custody of assets. Exactly. I mean, you mentioned something earlier on. We've had some, and I wrote, I wrote an article on this in terms of the bank. We, I call it banking crisis, but it's a crisis of its structure, really, rather than, and also the management of that structure. And in particular, you coming from an actuarial background, you understand assets and liabilities and the management of assets and liabilities. Um, are you happy to talk a little bit about what you saw at SVB, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, or what exacerbated this change in 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 uh, in in what they were doing? Dramatic, dramatic well, change. Well, uh, again, I'm not the banking expert or a regulator, but it's as you said, the system of banking is all about fractional reserve. So there's the misleading about what fractional reserve means. It doesn't mean that the bank doesn't have your money. What it doesn't have it is it doesn't have your asset in a form of liquid money. So what they do is when you deposit money in a bank, technically the bank, because it's not a non-for-profit, they need to make money. What they do is they try to invest your money. So usually they invest it in the uh, economy by providing lendings, 
lendings to companies, lendings to investors and whatnot. And they buy TBLs or they buy mortgages, asset backs, asset, all those elements, which is a portion of their balance sheet. And the way the regulation is done is they're doing it in a way that they assume that the way you're going to manage that risk will always allow you to cover any expected or slightly outside the norm withdrawal request. Meaning that if you want to withdraw your money, you will be able to get your money. So in reality, at a micro level, you don't think it's some fractional reserve bank because when you go and withdraw money, you get it. The problem is when you start to trigger a bank run, which is what Silicon Valley Bank got and got uh, in signature mainly, you end up in a situation where it started to tap into your longer duration asset, which in general is okay when rates are stable. But hmm. the problem is the, the the Fed increased the rate so fast that what looked like a safe investment a month, a year ago with a duration that could be longer term becomes a mark-to-market loss on your book because the interest rate has increased. So in a very simple explanation is if I bought $100, an asset that give me 1.5% of income per year, even if that asset is super secured, meaning it's backed by high quality mortgages or whatnot, if now the market rate is 4%, if I want to sell now that $100 to create the liquidity to fulfill your withdrawal, nobody's going to pay me $100 for that because why would they pay a product that pay me 1.5% when I can get 4.5 today? Yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask to buy it at a discount to create that same income I'm getting on another instrument. That discount is a mark-to-market loss. So usually that's where the bank capital is here for, which is, I'm going to swallow that that loss because I have the capital to swallow it. The problem is when the bank rates start to accelerate, you can't take all that loss. And a lot of small, medium-sized banks had probably a balance sheet that on the face value wasn't that bad, right? But in in the context of accelerated increase of rate in a short term, which didn't allow them to flip duration quick enough on their book, they would be prone to bank run. And then when you had the component of social media, Mm -hmm. which will exacerbate everything because Remember that in the old era, if you wanted to withdraw money from your bank, you had to go to the bank. So by definition, the bank run was limited in speed. Now, you read, you read on social media, be careful, your money is going to be lost. You go online, you type it, wire done. It's instant. So at the same time, the medium of transfer become faster. And the book of those, those banks were not necessarily as solid as they were because of the increase of rate. So in all that uh, in all that environment, you end up with a lot of banks that had some weak balance sheet, just because it's the way fractional reserve work. They were supposed to make money, but people tend to forget that a year ago rate was at zero. Yeah, a year ago rate were between zero to zero point five. Banks still needed to make money because they still had their infrastructure costs. So what they were doing is they were usually investing in a slightly longer duration asset to be able to collect some interest. And also, what people tend to forget is. It wasn't planned that rate will increase that fast because for a long time, we were told that inflation is transitory. We don't have to worry until we decided that we had to worry. And mm-hmm. when that worrisome come to kickstart, they had to act fast. And obviously, there were some impact on some boundary. Now, a bank like Silicon Valley Bank or Signature were structurally problematic because Silicon Valley Bank was very involved in higher risk portfolio investment and Signature Bank was a very big um, real estate-based bank. So by definition, they had longer duration in their book. But at the end, it goes down to the very nature of what a bank is. A bank responsibility is hold your money and try to make money out of your money in a safe way to the limit of the expectation. In 2008, they started trying to make that by buying and lending money to crazy, crazy, uh, um, uh, not crazy worthy, credit worthy people. And then bundle it and sell it between each other and creating derivatives on it. That was a 2008 crisis. The 2020 2023 crisis is not a crisis of reckless credit lending. It's a crisis of trying to captivate money in longer duration or slightly higher risk investment that are still within the authorized framework, but in an environment where rating rates increased so fast that it pretty much flooded their book with a lot of mark-to-market loss and then bank run triggered it. 2020, 2008 wasn't a bank run system. The bank were just insolvent by themselves because of the kind of investment they did. Mm-hmm. Here, it's because of the rate environment they're in. So it's a very different crisis, but it goes back to the same logic. When you put money in the bank, that money will be partially invested. And that's normal because banks need to make money. 
because they're not a non-for-profit. Exactly, exactly. So using all, all the new technologies that we have available today, and you've touched a bit upon it um, in terms of um, blockchain, you've talked a bit about um, cryptography, you've talked a bit about um, custody, you've talked about tokenizations, etc. How would the new technologies today be utilized in such a way that it makes access to cap access to deposits, access to capital more and more interesting in terms of the users feeling more confident that they're not going to lose their money? Well, very good question. Uh, the The question is about um, the, the base of the, the, the argumentation or their answer is to accept or not the original parameters of what you consider is fair or not with a bank. Mm -hmm. Again, if you look about what a bank is, it's an institution you trust for whom you put your deposit, and that bank responsibility is to make sure your deposit is safe and accessible at almost all time, right? And the role of the bank is to fund the economy in the sense that the bank is a very clear long of the economy where you go there. If you have a small business, you go to a bank to get a loan. If you want to buy a house, you go to a bank to get a loan. The bank is a critical part of the ecosystem. The issue here, though, is you as a deposit holder, you start to realize that you are pretty much holding some of the risk of that bank without necessarily the upside. I mean, we're lucky for people that have deposit in the U.S. because the U government or the FDIC say that they're going to back all deposit. But few people remember that in 2008, there were a bunch of people that had money in a Cypress bank and whatnot that had nothing to do with what those banks were doing. And they literally got a haircut on their deposit. So they were a customer and we were told, you know what, sorry, you're going to have to lose X percent of your deposit. So based on that, the issue is that you end up in a combination where you deposit money in an institution, but you're not pretty much getting the upside, but you are potentially exposed to the downside. Then on top of that, there could be the frustration where sometimes you feel like your bank is asking you too many documents when you are a clean person. And also, there's always a risk with a bank of all those uh, phishing and fraud. I mean, one of the biggest risks is phishing. Who didn't receive emails that look exactly like your bank, to whom you think you're going to log in, and then you get phished, and then you're screwed. So all of those elements together can be solved with cryptography, cryptography and blockchain. One of the things we're trying to work at IO, and, and I think many other companies are probably trying to focus on that, is you can use technology of cryptographic recognition like MPC. Right, which is a very well-known technology in the custody world of crypto, and use that as an authentication layer in the banking system to be able to finally give the power to the individual. Mm -hmm. For example, our MPC implementation, to the opposite of some others, is not built on servers, but it's built directly to your own device. So by doing that, you could pretty much transfer the ability to instruct on your account linked to your MPC signature environment, which reduces greatly your risk of fraud. and if you then had a tokenization of the asset on the permission-based blockchain, then only you can move the asset. So all those elements together allow you to use the technology of cryptography and blockchain to take back some of that control. However, the issue of unhosted wallet and self-custody is money laundering. You don't want to create a system that allows people to fund tourism or all other illegal activity by being anonymous, which is why you, I still believe that you need to be involved in an hybrid model yes. in a sense that if you think about it, a bank is a regulated institution or a fund or whatever that has been approved by the regulators as a guardian of the system. The real thing that they are guarding is making sure that the system is not used to fund illegal activities. That's all that KYC AML features. You can still use those banks and those skills in an environment where they can only be acting as an on and off uh, gate from a compliance perspective while you have full control of your own asset. And then you can decide, am I willing to make my asset available for lending with the risk that there may be some liquidity issue? Yes or no. Or do I want to just do it myself using DeFi protocol, which is pretty much aggregation of deposit of individuals willing to invest in a given product? And all of those elements can work with that cryptographic environment. You use a permission-based blockchain to be able to authenticate who is involved in the system. You use a tokenized asset on that permission-based blockchain, and then you use an identification system based on cryptography that allow you to not expose yourself to phishing and all those other risks and being able to 
literally give the power to the individual and identify that individual. And that is something that cryptography can bring on the table and should be explored further than just using blockchain to move a bond between two big institutions. But this is very interesting in terms of a, a, a what I would call di- your own individual digital identity that everybody would trust. How do you achieve that? Well, so there is a lot of product out there about digital IDs. My belief is that they're missing one element, which is the application aspect. I will, uh, for example, um, right now to be able to enforce law or regulation, you can't enforce it at the level of the individual for the simple reason that you cannot identify that individual. So what you're doing is you are enforcing it at the layer of the um, organization, the regulated institution. That's why you end up in a situation where you separate accredited investors and non-accredited investors because the only thing a bank can verify is how much money you have. They can't really verify if you're smart enough to understand investments. They can only know that if you have money, you can afford to lose it. Therefore, you are an accredited investor, if that makes sense. That aspect here, if you think about it, is you end up in a situation where the world has been evolving around trust environment because that's the only thing we could verify. Banks interact between each other using Swift as a messaging system because they know it's you via your Swift RMA key. Now, if we're able to use that system and give to each of those individuals a key, and there is a privacy-based ID on the permission-based chain that those regulated institutions have approved, all of a sudden, I have my sovereign ID. The thing is, the big challenge is surrounding how to distribute that key. And that's where I'm personally excited is it's all about the technology behind that. There is one cryptography technology today called MPC-TSS, which is widely used now in custody. I mean, the biggest player out there being Fireblock, Copper, they're using that MPC-TSS, same as BitGo, for crypto custody, right? The problem is they're using an implementation of it that is what we call 242 or 243, meaning two keys, they're both on a server. So that doesn't solve the problem of is it you or me that transact? So what we did at IOS is we, thanks to my team more than me, we use that technology, that MPC TSS, and we're able to do a proprietary implementation to the layer of the individual. So we're able to send those keys to your device or send those keys to a virtual signer, which could be a server you set up, which is you. Therefore, we solve the problem of identifying who you are. So since we've solved that problem in a cryptographic way, meaning is zero knowledge environment, meaning only you know the code, only you have whatever needs to be done to do that cryptographic signature. If I put that and linked it to a permission-based blockchain between regulated institution, I've created a system where I have now identified by whoever needs to identify me and confirm without having you to trust me that it's me. And then all of a sudden then you break that centralized aspect you can move to a decentralized aspect because now I can instruct a transaction and prove it's me, right? And yet you can still use a centralized ecosystem because what they've done that you can't do is all those investments surrounding money laundering, transaction monitoring, uh, money safety, and all those things. So you can still use them as a co-signer from a compliance perspective with your technology to be the one signing. Because right now I'll give you a very basic um, example that uh, that is kind of uh, funny that you can see in every day is yeah. the reason why, for example, one of the reason in payments, gambling, adult website are considered high risk. It's not from a money laundering perspective, I believe. It's more of a risk perspective. Why? Because I'm sure like there's a lot of chargeback in a sense that people go on the website or go on, on, on an adult website or on a, on a poker website, drop money, lose it, and then claim it's a fraud. The problem is for the bank, They can't really verify it was truly you because there's a possibility that the card was truly stolen, right? But if you integrate into it an MPC cryptographic signature to the layer of yourself that just you can sign, you can't claim a fraud anymore because there is an immutable proof on that permission chain system that only you have signed a transaction. So all of a sudden, because right now we are not able to completely prove who is behind a given transaction, there's a lot of high-risk things out there from a money laundering perspective, but also from a pure risk chargeback perspective that can be resolved by using cryptography. The key element, as you said from your question was, how can you make it work? Is you need to be able to have a proper technology to create multi-signature and single signature at the layer of the user using a known 
open source system, which is exactly what MPCTSS is. And this is what we've tried to do at IO on this integration. And then from there, you can create all that ecosystem in collaboration with centralized institution where you can have a proper mix between protecting the soundness of the uh, economy and the, the, the system while keeping control of your assets. Got it. For the sake of um, educating our, 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 our listeners, can you explain to them what MPC and TSS ah. means? Sorry. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to give you an explanation that uh, my dev team gave it to me, and I understood it very well because remember, I'm not a huge tech guy uh, from a development standpoint. Imagine that uh, you have a vault. So whatever vault. Imagine a visit a vault. Now imagine that this vault is uh, there is a wave link that allows you to access the vault. Okay, so it's a wavelength that has that secret code that opened the vault. And when I say open the vault, it can be seen as an authentication or it can be seen as data or it can be seen as your account or whatever it is, right? It's a wavelength. What the MPC TSS technology is, is you will cut that wavelength in pieces. Let's call them shares, okay? So right now, the most widely used technology is Fireblock. So what they do is they cut it in two shares or three shares. And then... So in our case, you can cut it as many shares as you wish. So let's assume you cut it in eight shares. So now your wavelength has eight shares. Okay, so it's been cut in eight pieces. But then what you do is you apply a threshold. That's the TSS aspect, threshold signing. Yeah. That is how many of those shares you need together to reproduce the wavelength. So what will happen is, and again, it's a very high level stuff. I'm sure that MPC developer is going to say it's very simplified. But what's happened is you say, let's say you've cut now that wavelength in eight shares. And now you say, I need four of those shares together to reproduce the wavelength. So what will happen is that the system will build between those eight shares, which will be held in your device, the correct formulation or the correct, I don't know, mathematical model, that if it has four of those shares that sign at the same time, they will interact between each other and reproduce the wavelength that give you access to the vault. So that's what MPC TSS is, is to pretty much being able to cut in pieces an access to a given device a uh, fault and then decide how many of those pieces you need together to reproduce the entire puzzle and that's what mpc tss is and that is done in a complete zero knowledge environment in a sense that i don't have access to your pieces and i cannot reproduce your pieces and you don't have access to my pieces mm -hmm. therefore if you want to act the system you need to literally pick all the single device of every single individual you need to run them at the same time to reproduce that wavelength, which is virtually impossible. And that is where we differentiate ourselves because right now the risk is on providers like Fireblock, it's two servers or three servers. So there's more likelihood you could act to servers, even if by the way, that's virtually impossible still, but more possible than act with eight iPhones. Got it. You see? Exactly. But that's what MPC TSS is. So when you look at that, you can start to build a complete authentication system that resolves so many challenges outside crypto world. And it goes back to what you said about the fact that people tend to restrict cryptography and blockchain to crypto, when in reality, it's an amazing technology for crypto, but it can be used for so many applications as soon as you extract from it, implement it differently and push it around, push it around to other applications. Absolutely. Would this app type of approach and application work? Because at the moment you're talking about individuals, but in the world, individuals come together in organizations, companies, groups, or whatever. There's a hierarchy in that in terms of decision-making process. So can this be applied to, say, a corporate digital identity with authorized signatories of offices? Of that exactly. Company? So that's what is really cool about the thing is the biggest challenge is actually the multi-sig aspect. Yeah. That's the point. And that's where MPC TSS has become pretty cool. Remember, I told you about the Wavelink. I told you about the eight chairs. Those eight chairs could very well be eight chairs in an organization. And you say, I need four signatory. But the way you could do it is you could have the CEO and the CFO that will get two shares so that if they sign together, they can approve a transaction. And then you can have the four other chairs that will be given to one, one, one to the financial controller, the operation guy that would need all of those four people to sign that given transaction or that given authentication. Or you can set up rules you wish. The beauty of it is, it will work in an organization or it will work at the individual basis. The way it would be is your key, and that's where we have that, that aspiration to become a super app ourselves in that aspect is, if I have my key with my own cryptographic authentication, yes. I could use it for my own accounts. 
I could use it in a joint account with my partner that has also a key for her, or I could use it in an organization where my ID and my key can be used in a combined reproduction of that wavelength of an organization. I can use it to log on a on a, on, a, on an adult website or on a, on a poker website that will use the part of the ID that will tell me I'm above 18 years old without knowing who I am. Or I can use it to, at one day, to go into one of those uh, connected devices to have the right to connect because I was given the right link to my ID and my personal public address that can only be activated by my private key. So with that, yes, you, you could be able to apply that through your organization, through your family env- uh, or environment, or yourself directly. Because again, it's your access. Yeah. It's your personal identification. Then you can use it with any power you wish in the environment. And again, in a zero-knowledge environment, in a sense that you can't be uh, involved in phishing because if somebody steal your credentials and apply it to another, I had that discussion literally three hours ago with my CTO, which was pretty cool. If somebody steal your credential to use such platform and then put it, uh, download an app that has those keys and put it on the app, it doesn't matter because that phone, even if it has a credential, doesn't have the cryptographic key to sign on everything you're involved in. So you just act, use less things, you see? Because again, you still mm. need that connection with your device that has been attached to a vault to transact. Absolutely. And that's where the power is. So you can apply to an organization, to an individual, and both at the same time. The biggest challenge here is adoption in terms of the individual managing this, what seems to be very complex, set of... No, that's... You're right, and sorry to cut you on that, is you're right about the fact that one of the biggest challenges of digital asset was making it easy. Yes. But here, our logic, for example, is you just download an app. That's okay. it. You download an app, then you, you have, now right now you still have that logic of 24 word that you can store, but that's something that we can easily improve by just providing services for someone to store the 24 word and the, the secure shares. But in reality, it's just downloading an app, the same way you download an app to go on Instagram or the same way you download an app to go on uh, on Telegram and whatnot. And then if you want to be a little more fancy, you can use that technology to do more. But again, it depends on the degree of what you want. When we go back to self-custody, even if you were into an environment where you allow people to be in control of their asset and only use your bank, for example, as a compliance layer, some people will love that and want to be in full control, do their own investments. And, and most other people will say, no, you know what? I'd rather keep my bank doing what they were doing because I'm comfortable with it. I don't want to bother myself with it. I don't want to have to, to challenge myself with it. You can even see that in the crypto, crypto world. A lot of people retail that bought crypto they did not want to bother with the custody aspect. They left it in the exchanges where they bought it from, right? Or they left it in their Revolut account or whatnot. So from that aspect, the accessibility of the technology is easy because it can be done just by a simple app and leveraging of the technology out there because the iPhone is one of the most mass, most secure mass market devices that exists, for example. But then you can go to the level of degree of development you want as a geek if you want to push it further, such as, which is possible or will be possible in a few weeks, is you will take a Raspberry Pi, which is a pure geek device, if you know about it, put yeah. it on a server and put your signature in there. Will the everyday Joe will do it? No. But will a portion of the population do it? Yes, because it's possible. So adoption is all about UX, UI, which is something that we have emphasized ourselves. And I do agree with you that if you can create the best technology in the world, but if it's not accessible, it doesn't work. That's one of the big difference between iPhones and many other phones. Apple launched... Most of the time, they launch features that exist somewhere else, but they've launched it in a way that you need it because you know how to use it. If there's no point to offer tons of stuff if you can't use it. If I need a PhD to know how to use a device, there's no point of it. Yeah. And that's something that is critical in the aspect. And we try to make it work in a way that we need to keep it simple. And that's probably me coming from another world than the tech world made me, because that's one of the issues with deaf people is they don't necessarily realize you have to keep it simple. Yes. And that's where the business side comes into play to teach you how to keep it simple. Otherwise, the best idea become impossible to use. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your IO network in terms of what can what can you do with it today and how can it help people today? Because there's a lot of things you've been talking about are what you want to do. So tell us what is the advantage of, of people joining the network today? Well, the IO network system is built upon uh, three critical elements. There is the permission-based blockchain, 
which is pretty much an EVM blockchain that regulated institution can hold a node. Then more importantly, based on our MPC TSS implementation, which yeah. allow you to truly be in a self-custody environment because only you, as we talked about, can have a piece of that wave link to reproduce a key. And then the ability to identify yourself on that permission-based blockchain so that we can make sure that things are not done in an anonymous way, but still keep your privacy. So today, you could technically use the IO network to do self-custody. You can use the IO network to uh, move funds, move crypto, or move asset or token asset, token as I said, within that permission-based environment that can be used by any banks. So you could have a bank that can create a 24-7, 365 MPC-based e-banking system, an MPC-based internal network or cross, uh, cross-institution cross network. We have all of those technology available. Then it's all about how to combine them to make the product we wish. What we try to do or expire to is to say, look, we have a, te- we have a technology that allows us to create our own product, which we already did, like the Vault product, which is a self-custody product, the network product, which is a 24 seven um, internal system of moving tokenized asset in a secure environment using MPC and self custody, or um, or um, using that also as an e-banking solution so that now instead of doing callback and emails to instruct, you can just instruct with your MPC key, which will be a very huge, is a huge breakthrough for banks. But we also believe that we have the base to really become a protocol. So what I mean by a protocol is that making available what we have to allow, allow other people to develop application. I mean, I give an anecdote that is um, quite funny as being French is one of the applications we could explore that we doesn't require that much work on our side is there is a huge debate in France about how to get um, access to free adult website where you can't be below 18. And the problem is everybody can access it. But then you challenge the problem of the privacy that goes with it. How can I verify that I'm above 18 without breaching privacy? And that aspect can be solved with the permission-based system. Why? Because if I have been approved by a regulated institution as who I am, that adult website can use that technology to pretty much uh, onboard um, into the system um, pretty much and be logged into, into the system with that technology that will call you, right? And pretty much call your device, you will sign with your wallet and it will identify without knowing who you are if you're above or below 18 years old, you see? So from that same base that you can use to authenticate into doing a transaction, you can use that to be identified in a poker website or on the company devices. And that's what is the capabilities of that. So some of it will be developed by us, but others is by providing our ecosystem and allow other people to use it and develop on top of it. Because at the end, what do we what do we pretend to be or want to be or are actually is the ability to provide individualized permission-based, but yet self-custody keys that will allow you to navigate an environment in a compliant way from a financial perspective, a custody perspective, but also an authentication perspective. So we're going to develop a lot of application ourselves around that base foundation, but we hope to allow other people to do that as well, because again, it opens up an entire doors of uh, development on top of it. And that's that's where what we can do. So that's where it's pretty cool. Wow, this is so exciting, Greg. I've learned a lot today from what uh, you've been talking about. And hopefully um, our, our um, viewers will be watching this as well in learning. I'm really excited to keep following IO Network, um, the IO um, Bennett company, to see the, your, your strides that you're making, the development and the adoption of what you're doing. I think it's great. If anybody wants to get hold of you, how do they get in touch with you? Well, they can go directly on the website of iofreenet.com and they can reach out to us there and we're pretty accessible. We're pretty accessible. on social media? Uh, we are on social media. I am personally on social media as well. I'm on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn and IO is also on Twitter and LinkedIn. So you can reach out to us there directly as well, indeed. So uh, uh, pretty simple by typing my name or IO Freenet name, actually. You will see us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Brilliant. That's been a really, really wonderful hour. I know that we all have other meetings to go to. And I thank you very much indeed for your time, Greg. And uh, good luck. And we would look forward to talking to you again in the future. Perfect. Thank you for having me and have a good week. Thank you for viewing and engaging with today's podcast. If you're interested in knowing more about citiesabc.com with openbusinesscouncil.org and fashionabc.org, go to our platforms as well as you can find me on social media. 
and DM me, Hilton Super, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And do go to the other interviews we have done on YouTube, and don't forget to like and comment. Thank you very much for your time and engaging with this interview on Cities ABC.